Okay, guys, so this is chapter 19, um, the uh, animal chapter, which is all about uh, everything going from water type animals to land. The evolution of animals here uh, is basically set up to be where um, you can see that all animals are multicellular, they're eukaryotes. Um, they are uh, examples can be protists, uh, plants, fungi, those are also eukaryotes, just like animals, except the difference for us is that we are um, not going to be autotrophic, so that removes the plant function. Um, we're like fungi, but instead we actually ingest our food and digest our food, whereas the fungi do it externally. And for animals, um, they tend to carry on sexual reproduction, so that is something that others do, but uh, for us, we tend to be specialized. Uh, our big claim to fame is having uh, muscle and nerve tissues. So those things uh, tend to be our uh, separate characteristics. And so there's examples. So you can see here the frog cell is um, going from a uh, single-celled organism to multicellular, and then finally Eventually, it's going to become a um, full-on uh, multicellular organism. It, this one does show metamorphosis. <clears throat> and so for animals, the thing is that uh, the way we figure that animals were put kind of back together is, uh, or actually came to be, is pretty simple. The idea was that we were a bunch of single-celled organisms that um, ended up forming a, a colony of some sort. And that colony eventually became the cells that we know of today that was probably a protozoan type animal. So we were very similar to them. And here's an example of what that looked like. So the thought was that you have a single flagellate organism and that they form an aggregate organism into this small sphere. And then once that got together, it started to form a more cooperative cell. But the thing that needed to be done for it to be considered a colonial animal is that it needs to be able to reproduce. So some of these spells, cells begin to specialize and that led to reproductive cells. And from there, that's how uh, most animals end up functioning. And so you see right there, once the reproductive tissues were made, then it became a folding of tissues and layers. And that's where the more complex animal organism came to be. And so today we still have some coanoflagellates that we think are examples of this. Um, our molecular data is showing that it is something that um, we're able to see now. And we do have some examples I mentioned in class. The, we have the Portuguese man o' war, which is a colonial organism as well. So it's not unheard of for this to happen even today. For animals, one of the things that we all tend to have in common is our multicellularity. That was our first step. So going from being a single cell organism to multicellular. Uh, we tend to have either radial or bilateral symmetry. Occasionally you'll have some without symmetry at all. That'll be something like a sponge. Um, and then our development tends to fall under one of two things. We're either protostomes or deuterostomes. Um, that's about what develops first and of course whether or not we have a body cavity. So that's what that coelom over here is going to be talked about in just a bit. And then, of course, we do have some segmentation, some of the lower organisms, that shows that they have different um, levels of separation in their body. And this is what the tree looked like. So there's a good organization, organization, organized way to look at it. Um, so you start over here at the uh, sponges, which are uh, no symmetry. Then you have radial symmetry, like the cnidarians. And then finally, you get the bilateral symmetry. And then over there towards the end, those were all the protostomes. And then you have the deuterostomes, uh, that have radial and bilateral symmetry. And so what I mean when I say radial symmetry, it's basically organized circularly. It can be dissected or bisected in um, different circular directions. Whereas bilateral symmetry, it only has one left and right half usually. And this is something that comes along with cephalization. Cephalization is basically the formation of a head. Um, so once that head or brain is localized in a sensory organ or a sensory portion of the body, that's how uh, bilateral symmetry starts to happen. And so here's some examples. You see there, there's the um, sea anemone or the sea squid. Um, that's the radial symmetry that can be cut in many directions. And then you have uh, 
the bilateral symmetry, which tends to have an anterior head, a posterior, which tends to be the tail, and then a dorsal, which is the upper side, and the ventral, which is the bottom side. Now, I mentioned protostomes and deuterostomes previously. What those are is whether or not something develops um, with their anus or their mouth first. Um, those that are protostomes, those are the ones that develop mouth first. That's an important thing because those organisms developed their mouth because a lot of them in the early stages tend to have a incomplete digestive system. So they only end up creating the one opening. Whereas deuterostomes have a, tend to have a complete digestive system. So that would be like the echinoderms, that's the starfish, the sea cucumbers, things like that. And the chordates, which are your... Um, you know, animals with backbones for the most part and then so that's something that, that's something that we've noticed was very different and uh, what happened first so again protostomes is first and that's the ones that develop with the mouth deuterostomes happen later and those develop the anus first and so you can see that if you can see most of the layering tends to be very similar if, that's, if they have a body cavity that body cavity will look pretty much the same but they will have a different way of getting there. So on the left, you have the protostomes. These um, develop their layers by splitting the mesoderm, then you end up with this blastopore, okay, and that blastopore starts to develop into your mouth. And then later, the animals will develop uh, the anus. So that doesn't mean that they have only one opening, but in the early organisms, they only had one opening. Then you get to the right side, and there the coelom develops from these out pockets or little spaces and that forms the blastopore and that hole becomes the anus first and then the mouth forms on the other side but as you can see ultimately in the early parts of this this is again early development their tissues look very similar almost no difference whatsoever it's just a matter of how they get there and again, when we say coelom, that means body cavity. So when you say a coelomate, that letter A right there, that means without. So a coelomate, no body cavity. And then you have pseudo, which means fake. So that one has a body cavity, but it's not your typical one. So it's basically got like a gap between the mesoderm and the ectoderm. You can see that here. The a coelomate has no gaps whatsoever. It's just got that space in the middle. And then, if you look at the pseudocelomate on the right, it's a roundworm. Those have the same things. They've got the ectoderm, the meso, and the endoderm, but they don't have any folding of tissue. They just have a gap in the tissues. So that's the difference where you get a coelomate. Those have a body cavity that is lined with the mesoderm. So basically, it's indicative that the tissue is, in this case, going to actually um, fold. And so that's going to leave more space for more complex organs. Um, in organisms like uh, the starfish, you're going to get that hydrostatic skeleton. So that the uh, coelom basically uh, supports the body without it actually having to have a bone skeleton. So you see there, there's the uh, uh, coelomate. That's the one that's got the actual fold in the uh, mesoderm. So it has a fold and a space in there. That's what creates the body cavity, which is much different if you go back a couple slides. Uh, that's much different than the pseudocelomate because there was no folding of tissue. It was just a gap in the tissue. So our first group of animals here tends to be the sponges. Um, they're characterized by their multicellularity. Um, their bodies kind of look like a potato sack with a bunch of holes in it. Um, that The reason that is is because they're filter feeders. So all they're going to do is let water push through their pores and they have these little cells that will allow them to get the food out of the water. And so uh, using those same cells, they can actually reproduce either asexually through something called budding or uh, sexually where they actually produce sperm and egg and release that into the water. And sponges are um, aquatic organisms. There's very few freshwater sponges. Most are salt water. So there's a simple anatomy of it. You've got that osculum, which is that outer spongy part, so to speak. Uh, where is, whereas in the middle, you don't have any organs or anything. You just have a central cavity. And that central cavity um, allows for water to come through. And those little pores along the edges there, those little holes have the ability to capture the food particles as they filter through. And then for our sponge anatomy here, 
Um, when you look at that in the microscopic level, you see they've got these little tiny variations of cells. So that's why we think they're so early in organisms because their cells already look like there's some sort of colonial aggregation. You know, you've got a um, cell with flagella in there. Um, it's called the coanocyte. Then you've got the pore cells, and then you've got some amoeba-like cells that we think do the eating for the for the sponge, and that's how they gather their energy. And if you look on here, this, those uh, coanocytes, those are called collar cells. Basically, they have a little flagella with tiny little cilia-like things that capture the food. Then we move into the cnidarians. These are the first ones to have true tissues, so they're not just some sort of a hydrostatic skeleton or anything like that. Um, we can actually see their um, fossils in some cases. And what we've noticed is that they tend to be all radially symmetrical, so they can be cut in any direction in a circle or in halves. Um, and then for them, they don't really have much of a nervous system. They just are able to uh, have these stinging cells on their tentacles, and those stinging cells are what they use to capture prey. So um, that's the cells that they have are called nidocytes. And then we do have other aquatic organisms, but mainly um, for cnidarians, they're, is, they're characterized by having those two germ layers, the ecto and the endoderm, no mesoderm, so they really can't even have that pseudocelomate body. They just are able to eat and, um, you know, reproduce. So. And as you can see on here, these cnidarians, there's two different forms. You've got the, um, the polyp form and the medusa form. The medusa form um, is the kind that swims around. So when you've got a hydra or a jellyfish and they're, um, they're able to move their tentacles and kind of use water pressure to move around, that's what we call the medusa. Whereas the sea anemone, those tend to be the polyp forms of the organism. So those just uh, stay in one spot and they're kind of an upside down jellyfish. And then you can see on this one on the left, the hydra is budding. That's one way they can do asexual reproduction. <clears throat> and then we mentioned the uh, Portuguese man of war earlier. That's a colonial organism, but they do belong in the same group as the rest of the jellyfish. But and that's the medusa form of it. And then you've got that cup coral there. That would be more of a, um, a polyp form. And then over here, we have the flatworms and the mollusks and the annelids. Those are basically a couple of different types of worms, as well as our soft tissue organisms, like snails and stuff like that. So for these, they have the three germ, germ layers. They are acelomates, so no body cavity. Um, and we've noticed that some of these can be flatworms that are free living. And sometimes you end up with um, those that are uh, parasitic. But for the most part, they are some, most of them are free living. And one of the things that characterizes these guys is they're the first ones to have cephalization. They have brain, they have brains, uh, eye spots, and they've got these little chemical chemosensitive organisms, which basically serve as their nose. So they can kind of sense, um, they can use that to you know, gather whether there's food or prey or even a hunter around. And one of the things that's unique about these guys is they, um, they have... Uh, they're hermaphroditic, which means they're both male and female at the same time, which allows them when they run into each other to cross fertilize. So uh, one will fertilize the other and vice versa at the same time. This is a unique uh, strategy because it actually allows them to mate uh, pretty quickly. And so even if they don't run into each other again, or very often, they are both able to get impregnated and then carry on to the next generation. So here you can see the uh, different anatomy of them. They've got their eye spots, um, the oracle on the side there. Those oracles are the uh, where they have the chemosensitive organisms or, or organs, so that's kind of like their nose. And then the pharynx, which is a um, kind of like a one hole does everything. It's um, got their mouth. It also is where they end up releasing any of their um, wastes and things like that. And they do release sperm uh, and gather sperm at the same time when they're doing that. And so there's some further anatomy of them. So they've got a full-on excretory system. Um, so even though it's only, it's not a complete digestive system, it is, they are still able to excrete fluid uh, with their waste. And they do have transverse nerves in the brain up at the top. So that's that cephalization we were mentioning. So they are able to feel and act and interact with their environment. And then you've got the sexual reproduction. Notice how they have ovaries and they have a penis. So they do end up producing um, 
do their testes sperm and they also are able to collect sperm and send it to the ovaries where they have eggs. So that's that hermaphroditic uh, property I was mentioning. And so beyond them, there are also the parasitic type flatworms. Those are what we call endoparasites. So they do live internally. They, their environment is their host. So they are not used to living out alone. Um, and so we have different classes of these, but most of them end up uh, like being like tapeworms where they can have their uh, scolex, which is the hooks attached to the intestine. And that's how an organism can actually um, can actually expel their uh, their babies, the uh, tapeworms particularly. They'll release little egg packets or little eggs when they uh, when their host um, goes to the bathroom. So that's not a pleasant thing. And they have these other organisms called flukes. Um, these basically are flukes that these are little flatworms that can live in different uh, habitats inside you know habitats and quotations around an organism. Um, but there's different types. You've got blood, liver, lung, you know, um, and that's one thing that's uh, that's new. So we end up having almost 300 million people these days that can get infected by schistosomiasis, which is a blood fluke. And so there's the parasitic worms. You've got there the on the left the tapeworm with the sucker and the hooks, and then on the right you have the blood fluke, which is very small. And those that's a male and a female about to mate. So. And then we have mollusks. Mollusks are your soft body organism. Um, you know, they tend to be, their phylum names tend to be in the name poda, which means foot. So you've got gastropoda, um, you've got cephalopoda. Um, and so those names, those are the ones that tell us where they are. So all of them contain mainly three things. You've got a visceral mass, which has their organs, that's their body. They have a foot, which is what they use for locomotion. In the squid, that would be tentacles, right? Um, but in the snail, it looks like a little rad, you know, rasping foot. And they have a mantle. Um, a lot of the times that mantle can um, excrete a shell. And that's why a lot of these mollusks do have shells. So mollusks are not like crabs. They're not moving from shell to shell. They're the ones that grow the shell. And that mantle does that. And many of them have a radula, which has these little tongue-like teeth, a tongue-like uh, organ that's got many teeth on it. And then right here, here's the basic general anatomy of a mollusk. They're not all the same, but you can picture this kind of like a snail, right? They've got that visceral mass, uh, the mantle, which is excreting the shell. And then inside, they have the typical organs. You've got the heart, the mantle cavity, the anus, the gills. Um, and they do all have gills, so they need to stay moist to be able to survive. And then they have the radula, which can be modified. Some are, you know, can be like a cone snail, where their radula has been modified into a harpoon, and that harpoon um, is what they use to fish for other fish. So it's kind of a unique strategy. And then we've got um, the main groups, right? The mollusks, the gastropods, the cephalopods, and the bivalves. So gastropods are the ones that we consider to be stomach foots, right? So their big claim to fame is they're snails that are always eating. So that's what they're doing when they're moving around. As you can see, they've got uh, some with shells, some that don't have shells. Those are called nudibranchs. Okay? So they do have the same gills. They've got the foot or the body. They have tentacles, and they've got a mantle, but their mantle is not excreting a shell. So they're the same as a land snail, just missing that portion. Then you've got cephalopods, which basically means head foot. Those are the ones that have bigger brains, like octopi, squids, and one you probably have not seen or don't remember, but the nautilus. Okay? Um, so for them, their foot, instead of it being just this raspy thing like a snail, it ends up being these tentacles and that can um, pretty much use it to move it around. Um, they have pretty good ner nervous systems. Um, they tend to be very smart, which is interesting because they can solve problems. And so here's some examples. You've got the octopus, you've got the nautilus. Nautilus is the only shelled cephalopod. Then you've got the bivalves. Those tend to be the clams, the oysters, the scallops, and the mussels. So they've got two parts of their shell, and the way they eat is by filter feeding. They take water in, and that water gets um, sifted through their body, and they collect all the food particles while the water just stays, goes, stays going through. So there's some examples of them. 
And on this slide, we have the annelids, the segmented worms. Those are your basic uh, earthworms, but there are different types in there. And um, they're interesting because they do have the full coelom. So they have a hydrostatic skeleton, um, which means that their body is doesn't have a true skeleton of any kind. It's just kind of pressurized with water. And it's done so because it's got that folding of tissues. Um, they have a full digestive tract. Um, so they've got the pharynx, the esophagus, crop, the gizzard, intestine, and the other glands as well. Um, and they do have a brain and a nervous system. Um, and what they have also is they have these uh, excretory systems called nephridia. And so they excrete the wastes in the opening of their walls. So they can actually excrete stuff through their outer skin. And so there's a typical earthworm anatomy. And so they do have a mouth and anus, so that's a complete digestive tract. And so they have that body segmentation. You can see that pretty well um, right here with these different segments on there. <clears throat> and so there's the cross section of it. So you can see the longitudinal muscles, the circular muscles. So they have a typical system. And they do have that ventral nerve cord um, on the bottom, that ventral uh, blood vessel as well. And they do have blood with hemoglobin, so that's kind of a weird thing. Um, if you've ever seen an earthworm, they uh, they actually do bleed. So, and then so these are other types of earthworms or annelids, uh, but there's a bunch in the ocean. They're called polychaetes and oligochaetes. So, polychaetes have many of these little setae or little um, little feet-like things on their ends, and some of those are used for filter feeding. Uh, and then oligochaetes have very few segments for their portions. So that's something that's interesting. Um, in the ocean, you've got these weird ones that are called um, Christmas tree worms. They'll actually um, release those setae and put them out, and the water will come in, and that will provide them uh, with their food, kind of like a sponge does. And here's another example of an annelid, except this one does not filter feed or um, feed on soil like earthworms do. These actually are leeches, they're uh, parasites. But what's interesting is um, they have no setae on their segments and um, they can be marine or terrestrial. But what's interesting about them is that they are fluid feeders. So they have these powerful anticoagulants. So people can, uh, who have uh, blood clot issues can be using them and these have actually been used in, med in medicine. So <clears throat> another group of uh, relatives of those are the roundworms. So annelids were segmented. Roundworms are not, they are pseudo -coelomates. so they do have a body cavity, but it's not fully lined with the mesoderm, as we mentioned, um, and they do have the digestive tract and everything. And one of the things that's unique about them is they can be both free-living and parasitic. Many examples can be like Ascaris, Trichinosis, uh, Elephantiasis, so pinworms and hookworms. All of these are the uh, parasitic versions of these roundworms. Here you have an example of one. Um, they can actually form these little spores or cysts inside the muscle tissue. So if you've got, um, you know, pork or red meat, a lot of the times these worms can actually form little cysts where they've got the worm in there, and that cyst can survive even if the food is is cooked. That's why um, even seeing any amount of roundworm in meat is not a good thing. <clears throat> then we get to the arthropods. These are kind of like the... Um, Gastropods, poda means foot, except in this case, arthro means joint. So these are jointed feet. And everything in this group is going to have some sort of a jointed appendage. That's their big thing. And then they also have an exoskeleton, which we mentioned previously, but that is made out of chitin. And so that exoskeleton tends to be molted, which means they have to shed it to grow. A lot of the times they have segmentation, which if you've seen any bugs or um, bug-like animals, segments are not very... The segments are almost always there. Um, and they do have a nervous system as well as respiratory organs. These little spots on their undersides, typically they tend to be spir spiracles. Um, and many of them undergo metamorphosis. It's a lifestyle difference between adulthood and their um, juvenile. That allows them to be able to get different resources without competing with each other. So a lot of the times you'll have like a dragonfly. Its larva lives in the water. And then when that nymph grows up and actually goes through metamorphosis, the dragonfly will live around the water, but it will not eat the same foods and compete for the same resources. That's a really good evolutionary um, characteristics. And then over here we have the uh, simple body plan of a crayfish.
your crayfish right here, it's got um, different segments, and you can see it's got different legs, and all those legs tend to have joints of some sort, right? Um, they tend to be decapods, like crabs and crayfish and lobsters. Um, so whenever you see them, their first group of claws is their first set. They usually have a group of claws on their um, mouth parts, and then or their legs. In these cases, they have the walking legs, and then these have swimmerettes on the end, the uropods. So depending on the body type, this is just kind of a general plan. But then you can see you've got butterflies. They are your classic case of metamorphosis. The caterpillar and the butterfly live very different lives. The caterpillar is about to lives its life eating um, plant material, whereas the butterfly still lives on plants, but it has a siphon that actually feeds off the nectar of certain plants, like milkweed and things like that. So again, that's a really good example of how the different lifestyle, so to speak, of the adult and the larva allow them to not have to compete with each other. Then you've got crustaceans. We used a lot of these in last semester when we talked about um, isopods. So you know those tend to be like cra uh, crab or excuse me barnacles, shrimp, lobsters, crabs, crayfish, and the pill bugs that we mentioned. Um, what they all have in common here is their head and their thorax are all fused together to make a cephalothorax, and then they also have these um, compound eyes and usually five pairs of appendages, and they all have gills. So even on our pill bugs, the ones on land, they have gills. That's why they have to live in such moist environments. If they don't, they won't survive. And so this group right here, the arachnids, these are the ones that we think of as bugs a lot of the time, but they're not. They don't have the same number of legs, and so they're, and they're not crustaceans. So uh, a lot of them are land animals. So you've got examples like spiders, or we call daddy long legs. Um, as well. Um, millipedes and centipedes, right? those just differ on how many pairs of appendages per segment. Um, horseshoe crabs, which are very ancient and they're being used for medical sciences. Horseshoe crabs are actually being drained of their blood because their blood has a very um, unique protein in it and they've been kind of half draining them and putting them back out. Um, and then of course you've got scorpions and mites and ticks. So all of those are bug-like but they're not bugs. So, you know, when you say bug, we tend to mean the next group, which are your insects. They tend to have three pairs of legs, and most of them, not all, have a pair of wings. Sometimes they have two pairs. Like if you've ever seen a ladybug fly, they actually have two pairs of wings under their um, uh, carapace, so to speak. And um, one of them tends to be that upper pair of wings and the lower, and that helps with the lift and drag um, when flying. And so, uh, and they have the three, they do have the three segments to their body. So it's the, body, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen of some sort. And you can see there's a big variation of these. You've got little mites and scale beetles. Um, fleas tend to be uh, confused with ticks, whether or not they're bugs, but ticks are arachnids because they have that, uh, usually that different number of legs. And then you've got walking stick bugs. Um, Leaf hoppers or grasshoppers, dragonflies, houseflies, they're all different groups. And so there's the lubber grasshopper, the honeybee, uh, big luna moth. So they all undergo different things. Some, like the grasshopper, undergo incomplete metamorphosis. So the grasshopper does molt and shed, but when it's a juvenile and it was an adult, they actually look pretty much the same. They've just changed in size. So that's considered to be an incomplete metamorphosis. <clears throat> And so this is something that's really interesting about all the bugs is, you know, the decapods, like the crabs, crustaceans, things like that, they had many legs to be able to do their, their work. Um, what a grasshopper and other bugs do is they have many parts to their facial uh, mouth that actually allows them to eat. They've got a labrum, which is kind of like a lip, those labial palps. Those are used to help taste and reach for food. Um, they've got these maxilla and maxillary palps that actually push food in and then you're probably very familiar with the left and right mandibles. That's what they use to chop up food. And, um, you know, I'm pretty sure you've seen ants carrying leaves around in their mouths. That's what they do. It. They use these mouth parts to be able to do all that. Then we get to the um, um, invertebrate groups that are mostly related to us. Those are the deuterostomes, but um, the big group here is the echinoderms. Those are the ones, echino means spiny, derm means skin. So when we're thinking about spiny skin, like a sea urchin, 
a starfish, um, another group that we talked about in class, the sea cucumber. So those organisms, they have free swimming larvae and they tend to be filter feeders. And when their larvae are young, they're bilateral, but then when they get older, they tend to have radial symmetry. So that does change. So they have no head or brain or segmentation. They only have those portions when they're in larval stage. And so their locomotion is what we call a water vascular system. You're going to see this when we dissect starfish later. But um, they use water. They push it through an opening in their body. And that's what they use to move their little tube feet around. Um, we saw some of those videos in class. But they're able to actually physically pump that water through. And that moves their feet so they can produce a suction and get going. So they don't really have a respiratory or excretory or circulatory system that's complete. So it's it's weird because they're most related to us. They actually are deuterostomes, which means they develop like us with their anus first in that blastula stage. And then later on, the mouth develops. Um, but they're still pretty, what we would call um, primitive. And these are all the different types. So have you ever seen a sand dollar? Those are sea stars right there, or brittle stars. Uh, sea urchins as well, sea cucumbers, sea lilies, all these tend to be um, in marine water. Some are fresh, but very few. But they all are pretty characteristic of having that spiny type skin. And so there's kind of the whole thing. This is when they're adults. As you can see, it's got that radial symmetry, but it doesn't really have a nervous system or a, or a brain. That kind of stuff is used mostly in their larval stage. And when they're larvae, they are bilaterally symmetrical. But here, you can see the skin gills. They've got, they do have gonads in pretty much every arm of their star. They have a pyloric stomach and a cardiac stomach. The cardiac one is used to pump water, and the pyloric one is what they use to actually feed. A starfish will spit its stomach out, wrap its stomach around the food, digest it. And because it doesn't have a complete digestive system, it will actually just spit the food back out of the same open. So that's a weird thing. You think since they're most closely related to us, they'd have some uh, more characteristics like us, but it's not to be, at least not when they're adults. Then we get to the chordates, right? So chordates we all think of as things with backbones, right? But that's not always the case. Um, the early chordates, which we're going to show you the two examples right now, those do not have a backbone. They actually need to have only two things and a lot of the times these happen when they're in larval stages so vertebrates like us we have an endoskeleton of cartilage or bone but these first two they don't have to have the cartilage or the bone they actually have this dorsal rod inside uh, made out of tissue it's called a notochord okay and they also usually around that notochord also have a nerve cord well that's all you really need to be considered a chordate. You don't have to have a backbone, but many of us do, and that's why we relate it to that. The other two things you're gonna notice is we all have pharyngeal pouches or little slits. Um, those tend to be gills in fish and amphibians when they're before they metamorphosize. And um, we all have a postanal tail. Some have lost that. A lot of these characteristics, you're only gonna see them when they're in larval stage and they go away. So like these first two, you'll see that right now. So these are the pharyngeal pouches you'll see. Those tend to be gills, or later on they become lungs in um, uh, more evolved organisms. And you've got that dorsal nerve cord at the top. So we do, they tend to have a nerve cord at the back, but it doesn't have to have a backbone. They've got the notochord there, which is that rod of tissue, and everything has a post-anal tail. So after the anus, they end up having some sort of a tail. You'll see later in monkeys, they're used for balance, things like that. Other animals, they are uh, you know, just part of their typical anatomy. So here are the invertebrate chordates. These are one group called sea squirts. When they are adults, they kind of look like a sea anemone or a squid, or, or not even a squid, I would say more of like a sponge. Or a lot of times they also get mistaken for coral. So these things, they have those four characteristics but those four characteristics are only seen when they're in larval stage. So when they're in larval stage, they do have the pharyngeal pouches. They do have the, nor the notochord, the dorsal nerve cord, everything. But when they metamorphosize, they become this sessile adult, which means they don't move anymore. And that the only thing they actually retain are the gill slits 
um, that became that were from those pharyngeal pharyngeal pouches. So it's interesting because they don't have any of the characteristics of a chordate when they're adults, but when they were larvae, they do. So they're invertebrate chordates, no backbone. There's another group of invertebrate chordates, and that's in the next slide. Those are called lancelets. Lancelets look like worms, and they're almost like worms, except they have the four characteristics that we were talking about as adults. So they have the pouches, they have the notochord, the nerve cord, and they have the postanal tail. Um, and we see them as worms. They look like worms to us because they also have segmentations, but they have a muscle cord and they have a nerve cord. So it looks very close to us, but because they don't have a bone, uh, endoskeleton bone or cartilage backbone, but we're, they're still considered invertebrate chordates. And so there's many steps that a chordate has gone through to get to us. And you're going to see that those steps pretty much led to these new branches. And we're the shortest branch of the chordate family tree. So those steps are very simple. The first thing that shows up is vertebrae, right? So you start with your invertebrate. It ends up developing a backbone and an endoskeleton of some sort, whether it's cartilage or bone, that's different. But that's the first thing. After that, jaws have to be formed. So it's one thing to have a mouth, but then to have full-on working jaws, that's, a, that's the next step. Then the skeleton changes from cartilage to bone. Finally, you go from having gills to lungs. And then the next step is to have appendages that are jointed. So a little bit like um, a crab or crustacean, except ours are not multi-jointed. And then the next step after that is to have an amniotic egg. At that point, the amnion becomes important to develop that embryo outside of the mom. And then you have mammary glands, which leads to mammals, which is the ability to produce milk and keep the baby with you uh, throughout time. So you see it on the next slide. Here we have all the different changes, right? It starts with some ancestral chordate, something that we were all related to. It probably looks very, li very much like a tunicate. And then you have the um, uh, lancelets, and those two have very similar characteristics. One just doesn't show all the four characteristics of a chordate as an adult. <clears throat> Excuse me. And then um, the jawless fish are the first ones to form the vertebrae. So they have a full-on skeleton. It's a cartilage skeleton, though. And um, <clears throat> then you've got the jaws of a uh, shark. Those are cartilaginous jaws uh, and skeleton. And then that changes into bony fish. And then the next thing is you have lobe finned fish that actually have lungs. And then from there you have the limbed organisms like amphibians, reptiles. Um, but those along the way, when you get to reptiles, have an amniotic egg. And then you've got mammary glands in the mounts. So um, lots of changes happened along the way. Okay, and so the first group are the. Um, uh, first fish and they have jaws um, and the beginning of those before we have two examples still alive today those are the jawless fish and then eventually they became cartilaginous fish and then bony fish um, so we think the jaws evolved from gills that we had gill arches that eventually became more useful um, for chewing or biting food food and that's how um, the jaws came to be. So if you see some of the diagrams here, the first jawless fish, which still look like the ones today, they have a skull, they have gill arches, gill slits, but they don't really have, um, they have a mouth, but no jaws to do anything other than suck or tear at flesh, right? So eventually that became a little bit more pronounced and those with the jaws that were more useful kept on until finally you had the jawed fish like a shark. But today there's two examples of jawless fish still. Those two examples are the lamprey, which is kind of a parasitic uh, fish. It hooks on to other fish and uh, kind of like a leech drinks their blood, but they don't um, have an anticoagulant. They actually have like a, a toothy mouth. So there's no jaws, no biting involved. They stick their mouth onto the fish and they use their tongue, which is also bony, to drill a hole and then they use their mouth to kind of keep the blood flowing. 
And now their relatives, the hagfish, we saw a video of those in class. Those are the ones, they don't have the mouth with, with a tooth like this. They have kind of like two lips with a bunch of teeth. And they use those two lips to rip the flesh off. So uh, the lamprey is more of a um, parasitic type fish. And the hagfish is more of a scavenger. Then we get to the ones that we know more, these cartilaginous fish, like sharks, rays, um, skates is another type of cartilaginous fish. These guys have been around for millions of years, as long as the dinosaurs. Uh, they have skeletons, but it's not made of bone, it's made out of cartilage. Because of this, they lack things like rib cages. So, you know, dolphins will attack the midsection of a shark because there uh, is no rib cage to protect them from damage. So if uh, dolphins are attacked, a pod of dolphins are attacked by a shark like that, that's actually how they'll defend themselves. But these are really well-developed predators. They've got uh, the ability to sense electrical currents under their nose. They have a lateral line to de detect movement. And they've got, I don't want to say smell because they're not really sniffing the water, but they're able to pump water through their nose and there's chemoreceptors in there. That's how they're able to get the scent, quote unquote, of blood. Um, so they're really well-designed predators and they've been around for millions of years. Then from there, the next evolutionary step was going from a cartilage skeleton to a bony skeleton. So, you know, these fish are probably the most numerous. We call them ray finned because they're fins while they do move and are able to flap or give direction they're not able to be jointed or movable right so we'll get to those in a second uh, but these are your typical like perch salmon trout um, things like that and they can be many different types of things filter feeders carnivores herbivores uh, but what's interesting about them is they have a buoyancy organ okay um, they've got a pocket in there that holds a ton of uh, air, it's called the swim bladder. So that's how they actually are able to float. Um, the shark is able to float because it's got a bunch of oil in its liver. And oil doesn't float on water, uh, or oil doesn't sink, it floats on water. So that's how the shark's able to keep themselves buoyant in the water. Whereas a bony fish doesn't have that giant liver, they've got a sac in the middle of their organ system and they can fill it with air or get rid of the air, and that will allow them to move vertically in a water column and so that's actually important because in the next group of fish that's what we think eventually evolved into the modern lung so in the lobe fin fish they've got a big lung for respiration so they actually do use it to um, get energy and synthesize that energy that's an interesting thing because this is how we feel that amphibians came to be so they got unique by being able to use their locomotion of their fins. And then they had that swim bladder that metamor not metamorphosized, but evolved into lungs. And that's how we got to the next step. So that's a lobe fin fish. So that's what these guys look like. They have the fins of a fish, but they have like a little extra fleshy joint. And that fleshy joint eventually became a bony joint that eventually became the modern day feet and arms of an amphibian. So that's how we go from fish to amphibian. But amphibians have limitations. Um, they do have the jointed limbs. These are the first groups to have eyelids and ears, right? So, um, you know, most sharks or fish, other fish, had um, have a way of sensing movement or electric current in the water. Well, amphibians actually have a tympanic membrane. It's a little covering over their ear holes, and they're able to actually gather the sound from the environment. Uh, with those tympanic membranes. And what's interesting about them too is now they have um, a full on larynx. So, you know, we've heard that, um, you know, some fish can put out a current into the water. Um, well, these guys have a larynx so they can actually make sound. And that's how, if you've ever been around a pond or a lake or a canal, whenever it rains, um, you know, every frog out there thinks they're Elvis trying to um, impress other female frogs. So, um, that's through their, their evolved larynxes and they have larger brains. So they're able to, uh, you know, think better and not so much problem solve, but, uh, adapt to their environment. And what's interesting about them is they have a three chambered heart. Fish have a two chambered heart. So there's a lot of, um, mixing of oxygenated and deoxygenated blood. Well, amphibians go a step further and they have three chambers. So there's less mixing, but there's still an issue with that. So that's why frogs have probably what's one of the 
their most unique characteristics besides metamorphosizing, they can breathe through their skin. So there's an amphibian. This is a newt that never loses its tail. Uh, so you have some that do stay in the water their whole life, but they always develop lungs. So this one is just able to swim around as well as crawl. So, but this is the weird part. So they have these small lungs that are able to breathe, but they do have blood that's still mixed with their deoxygenated blood. So what they do is they actually pump their blood to their skin so they can get further oxygen. Um, this is one way that they're able to, uh, to breathe as well. And that's why chytrid fungus has been so bad for amphibians. It actually kind of clogs those pores up and they suffocate and get very rigid and that's how they die. Um, and again, the, uh, besides their breathing through their skin, their big claim to fame is that they do have metamorphosis. So they start off as fish-like organisms, gills and everything, and then they absorb their tails, their gills eventually become lungs, and then they move on to land. So that's the first step. But the thing is, they're limited in that they have to stay by the water. That's where reptiles come in. Eventually, organisms needed to get away from water. So where reptiles come in is uh, between 245 to 60 some million years ago, modern day uh, reptiles start to diversify. Um, that's the ages of dinosaurs. They've got these bipedal stances. Um, and then eventually, the whole reason they've evolved is they have scales. Okay, The scales protect them from losing water. Because when you're an amphibian, you've got smooth skin. If you dry out, an amphibian just becomes a dried out carcass. Whereas you have some lizards that will live in the desert and they do not have to live like an amphibious toad in the desert. Those have to live deep down underground only come out when it rains. Some lizards can live in, you know, 110, 120 degree weather. We have lizards here in the valley that'll be running around, you know, when it's 105 and the concrete brings the temperature of the concrete to like 115, 120. Um, and they actually have that three chambered heart as well. So they still have some issues with that, um, but they do have more well-developed lungs and they do have that rib cage protecting them. And so a snake is a reptile. Um, a, a snake actually used to be a tetrapod, but that group of reptiles eventually lost that ability and did better in a slithering motion. That's what came, what came to the modern diversified snake. But their skin is what protects them from losing water regularly. And again, their big thing is they were the first ones in our evolutionary tree to show up with an amniotic egg. So now when they're developing the egg, you don't need to drop it in water like an amphibian or a fish does. Um, now they have a leathery or a egg type shell and their amnion or amnion, yeah, that's a better way to say it. The amnion helps them with food, water, and it, gives, it gets rid of the nitrogenous waste while they're in there. Because even when you're an embryo, you're producing waste, that helps it. And the other term to remember here for reptiles is and other things below them they are ectothermic so they're not cold-blooded they are ectothermic which means that their temperature is controlled by their environmental interaction so we are endotherms our temperature is controlled internally but their ectotherms their temperature has to be controlled externally and so they have to move around a lot and there you have an example of the amnion so they've got the embryo inside growing, and it's attached to the yolk sac. The yolk sac is what provides the nutrients, it helps get rid of the waste, and a lot of the times when reptiles are born, the amnion will still be attached to them for a couple days later so that it will still, um, they'll still be able to produce energy and have that in case the environment's not great for them to survive on their own. And then we get to the discussion about birds and how Birds used to be reptiles. They're modern day relatives, they're crocodiles. Birds and crocodiles and um, dinosaurs shared many characteristics. We think that dinosaurs and all these other ones, they all have four chambered hearts. So they no longer um, have blood mixing and um, they all have tails with vertebrae. They have clawed feet and they have scales. Birds scales are their feathers, they're just modified. Originally the thought was that birds did not evolve 
feathers for flight. The flight was a secondary characteristic. Flight only evolved because the feathers were already there. The feathers originally were there for warmth. As I mentioned, birds, crocodiles, and dinosaurs are endothermic reptiles. They're able to control their heat internally or generated internally, which makes them different from other reptiles, you know, modern, smaller ones. So they are modern day dinosaurs. I know it doesn't look like it, but they are. And now that um, feature of feathers has been modified so that all it does in some species is live for flight. Right? So they've got a horny beak, which is very light compared to the heavy jaws with teeth. Um, they have hollow bones, a lot of air cavities in their bones. Um, they've got their forelimbs, which is their arms. They've been modified to wings. And they do have a full four-chambered heart, well-developed brains. And um, so that's why there's a lot of evidence that shows that birds evolved from the dinosaurs that survived the last extinction 65 million years ago. And so now they're well developed for flight. They have this um, crop and gizzard in there, okay? So they hold a rock inside that helps break food down in the gizzard. But they do have a complete digestive system. Um, they have a rectum and a cloaca, which is one opening. Um, but they're modern day um, dinosaurs. So when you see a pigeon, you know, watch out. It's the T-Rex's baby cousin. And so as you can see, birds have a lot of modifications, you know, um, cardinals right there, they've got short stout beaks to be able to crack seeds and nuts. Um, flamingos have little smooth color or smooth shaped um, uh, beaks so that they can filter through mud. That's what they're doing all the time when they're standing in mud. And they don't actually look pink, they only get that color from the food they eat. And then the bald eagle's beak is for tearing prey apart. So they're a very diversified group. The uh, bald eagle is actually probably and that family of birds, they're the ones that are most related to those dinosaurs. They're the raptors or the birds of prey. Then we get to the mammals, okay? Mammals have a couple of characteristics, but we are amniotes also, just like um, the lizards and reptiles. And we are endotherms, just like crocodiles and pigeons and dinosaurs. What's different about us is we do not have feathers or scales we have hair for insulation, and the whole name mammals is derived from the big glands we have that make the female able to feed her young without having to leave them. That's called a mammary gland. And so this picture is a little off here, but the monotreme is the uh, weird group. They're the ones that are related to the um, uh, spiny anteater and the duckbill platypus. Monotremes have a cloaca like birds. They lay hard shelled eggs, but they are amnions, but they do have mammary glands. Now, what's different about them is they're kind of weird because they don't really have like a, a single opening, like a nipple to release, release their milk. A lot of the times they'll excrete their milk and the babies will kind of lap it up from one section of their body. So, but they do produce milk from their mammary glands. And then the next group of mammals that's unique are the marsupials. These are born in immature condition and the female has to take care of them, usually in a pouch of some sort. Australia has many of these mammals. Those um, uh, we think exist because Australia broke off the main continent of Pangaea very early. And because the majority of mammals that were living on there were marsupials, that's why you have things like koalas, kangaroos. Used to be we had the ten Tasmanian tiger, which is kind of like a dog-like animal, um, but uh, it went extinct. And so those animals are, are all marsupials. The only one in North America that we have is the Virginia opossum. So that one is a uh, marsupial mammal of North America, the only one we have. And uh, opossums are not bad. A lot of people give them a bad rap, but you know they actually eat fleas and ticks from your yard. Um, they really only come out at night, and uh, they're unable to carry the rabies virus. So that's not something that you have to worry too much about. Then we get to the ones that are like us. Those are placental mammals. These are the ones that um, uh, have a connection to their mom, and they grow through their mom, and they uh, 
are fully not fully developed because they're not adults, but they're much much more developed when uh, when born from their mom. And again, we're well adapted to life on land. They have a well developed brain. They continue to have that four chambered heart. They're endotherms as well. And um, the way we separate mammals out is how they get their food and how they move around. So you can see there, there's a, a killer whale, which is not a whale, it's a dolphin. Right? Just call it a whale because it's huge. And then we've got primates, which is our group of mammals. So human evolution started with um, the first group of little simians we call prosimians. Those are lem lemurs, tarsiers, um, and lorises. Those are the early monkeys. And then you get the um, anthropoids, which are the, um, the, what we call, I think, the New World monkeys. Then we have apes, and then finally humans. Okay. But for humans, we are very unique because we have opposable thumbs, which means our thumb can touch every other of the four digits, right? If you look at a, a paw of a cat or a dog, they have that, like, really short claw that's higher up. Um, it's called the dew claw, right? That claw is not movable. It cannot touch the other uh, digits of the paw, whereas us, we are able to do that. We're able to manipulate. That's originally a, a tree climbing uh, uh, benefit. So us and the other primates can do that, as well as raccoons and opossums. Those characteristics are needed if you're going to be able to climb, move around. And so eventually we end up evolving from those apes, um, but we're not evolved from the modern apes. We had an ape relative all of us and those modern apes still exist so here's the tree so you can understand so the first mammal was some sort of a small primate of some sort or the first uh, primate was a small little tiny primate animal and that eventually evolved into the lemurs and then the new world monkeys okay then you got the old world monkeys which had tails or have tails and then the gibbons, and then finally the chimpanzees, and the hominids, which are us, humans. So, as you can see, we did not evolve from apes and chimps. So don't ever get that confused. We didn't, you know, when people make that argument, if we evolved from monkeys and apes, how come there's still monkeys and apes? We did not. We all evolved from a common ancestor. They have just been around longer, and they have survived that long. So... You know, think of it like like this. You don't evolve from your cousins or your siblings. They came from a common ancestor, which was your parents or your grandparents or great-grandparents or whoever down the line, right? So that's what we are today. We are um, brothers and sisters and cousins of the primates and monkeys living today. And so for us, uh, hominins are pretty much just um, the ones that stand up and walk on two feet and we are our characteristic our big claim to fame is our brain right we're not well cut out for um, hunting we're, we don't have claws we're not fast um, we're not you know large and imposing I mean not in the kind of way that you want to use your advantage in hunting and you know we don't have sharp teeth or anything like that but as we go along from seven million years ago to today the adaptation has been that we have bigger brains. And so as you can see, right, we start off down at the bottom here, seven million years ago, the first hominids show up. They're more related to apes than they are to modern day humans. And they look much like those apes. Well, as we go on further into the evolutionary chain, you start to see that the brain gets bigger, the face gets a little flatter, and the eyebrows become less prominent. And by the time you get to Homo sapiens and Homo habilis and Homo erectus, those are the ones that are able to use more of their um, thinking and uh, make tools to get around our evolutionary weaknesses. And so as you can see, here's uh, Australopithecines. This was um, a, um, a fossil, a frozen fossil that we found. Uh, of what we think was one of our almost quote-unquote missing links but she had a very small brain she was ape-like but she stood upright and um, so that's something that we figured to be our one of our first things and this led to the idea of mosaic evolution 
the idea for this is that, well, maybe not all body parts for these animals uh, evolved at the same speed. And because of that, you end up with, um, with you know, brain parts that are getting bigger while, or physical adaptations that look different. You're going to see that in Neanderthals in just a bit. And so one of our closer relatives is Homo habilis. Okay, so these guys had stone tools. They um, were able to probably start with speech, and that's where we think culture started to uh, re, not reform, but uh, started to really get uh, much more adapted. And so uh, from there, we start to be able to talk and transmit our knowledge, and that led to kind of the modern day human uh, coming along. And then we had Homo erectus, which was up to about 300,000 years ago. They were more robust, taller, um, and they started through Africa. Uh, and their first, they were the first ones to use fire and start to fashion you know, more advanced tools. And then finally, you had modern humans. We think that the modern human came out of Africa. Um, and this led to, uh, this leads to what we call the replacement model. The idea is that there were many different individual groups of humans or hominids, and that they were all overtaken by um, by this one group that kind of went through Africa and did better. So those individuals, uh, they start to kind of move in, and you'll see that uh, they. That's why there's you know there are no real differences genetically in uh, in humans everywhere so that's why like when european explorers came over to north america the idea was that um, there was no different species because we all end up coming out of the same group now again that's being challenged and we're not sure but it is kind of the working theory that we have so here's kind of a diagram of that you start with some form of homo aragaster right uh some homo type species and that um species eventually moves in and becomes Homo sapiens, and all these other groups are taken over by the Homo sapiens that came out of Africa. And that's why present day, all those species are one. We are not different, really, genetically. And that's why there's no difficulty of interbreeding between our populations. And then you have uh, Neanderthals, that's um, one of our closer relatives. We think they were actually pretty culturally advanced and you know began some of the adaptations that we know of um, that's where uh, that's where there was a lot of um, beginnings of traditions like uh, religion flowers tools um, being buried with their dead and stuff like that so um, some new modern evidence is showing that these species were pretty successful and that homo sapiens were successful at the same time and that they ended up interbreeding that kind of you know, became this mosaic uh, human that we know of today. And that's us, that's Cro-Magnons. Um, we're the modern appearance, they have advanced tools, we make knife-like blades. They probably think that our um, ancestors were the reasons why um, there was uh, quite a bit of species that went extinct, like the, sloth, the giant sloth, the mammoth, the saber-toothed tiger, even the giant ox, these species probably went extinct because of our hunt, hunting habits. So we stopped not being hunter-gatherers and began to become tribal, hunt cooperatively, and of course have culture and language. And that's what uh, leads to modern day humans and the modern cave painting, or the ancient cave paintings you see um, in caves. And that's all.